Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to be with you on a Thursday. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson back in rocking the, we're talking about practice t-shirt. I thought it was a run the damn ball t-shirt. That is for only Fridays. Yes or no? Uh, Yeah. Actually, no, I don't. I don't have one of those, Schmitty. Really? Run the damn ball? No, I don't Elijah's have one. Elijah's got a run the damn ball t shirt. Cranack has, like, I think oh, Cranack, yeah. our Saturday co host, has it painted on his wall, like bedroom wall, <laughs> run the damn ball. So, yeah, we will we will run it to uh, some some insight from uh, Mitch Sherman from The Athletic in about 20 minutes. Busy hour two. We'll talk with Gary Barnett, gloating, no doubt. <laughs> After the 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 rib off win, uh, we'll talk some college ball with Gary Barnett, Brandon Vogel, HaleVarsity.com and magazine managing editor. Vogues uh, has the the I eighty podcast, the I eighty preview, and has just a wonderful breakdown, full gore of of how the defense takes and makes a step right. And uh, Danny Burke, pride of Chicago, Burke's best bets. So we'll get into this with Danny. And we'll start off, too, with some thoughts on on the defense. We'll hear from Scott Frost tomorrow post-practice. And uh, a couple more nuggets from the Bo Pelini. Will Compton sit down? We didn't get to yesterday, specifically when things got a little bit tight. And and that is not just a, a, a Bo Pelini thing or a Mike Riley thing or a Frank Solich thing or even a Scott Frost thing. How do you react under pressure? What's your leadership like under pressure, either with your peers, with your teammates, with your captains, with your stars? And then what's your leadership like from your position coaches, your head coaches, your coordinators? Is it, oh my God, the boat's sinking? (laughs) Is it Costanza running out of the bathroom when he hears, the word fire as he's throwing six and seven year olds aside to save himself or do you look around and try and save uh, the dog in the corner and then get everybody out before you uh, find a way out of danger you know what's the leadership what's the poise like that's something man that's going to be so 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 key every year but this year because Nebraska and their poise going to be tested and tested mightily. And it's going to be tested. And I think y- you you want guys that have seen it all, been, been in about every type of game. And I think you have that with Adrian Martinez. And you, I, th- I think you absolutely have that with uh, Cam Taylor Britt, JoJo Doman, for sure, Deontay Williams. I mean, kind of your vocal leader. In in the in the safety spot, Ben Stilley, sixth year baby. I mean, he's he's seen everything at Nebraska football. So from, from legit from an experience, and I, I've seen the world, right? It's impressive. <laughs> but well, how do you how do you handle it better? What can what can you do as an individual? What can you do as a unit? What can you do as a team to make the outcomes different? Right. Because, God, I mean, that's kind of been the theme in Nebraska football, the the heartbreak. And and some of it's your own doing, and some of it is someone else making a play. Now, forever, it was really only Oklahoma and that damn Sooner Magic doing it to you. Otherwise, you're pretty good. You were were the one stomping on somebody like you're putting a cigarette out, and it's 10-2, and and you ran for 475 yards at halftime. Now you'll have an opportunity. Okay, Will, we're going to do a little quick exercise. Win, lose, or toss up. I like it. Pull up Nebraska's schedule. Okay. Agree, disagree, drug test me, whatever you want to do. All right. But here are my here are my wins. 
and and my my toss up list is much longer than my loss list. Okay, and my even my win list. My win and my loss list are equal at three, three teams each. Okay, Ford, me, okay. Ford, Fordham, Buffalo, and Purdue wins. Right. All right. Losses, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Whiskey. Toss-up, Illinois, Michigan State, Northwestern at Minnesota, Michigan, Iowa. Hmm. Would you move Eddie from one category to another? Um, and I'm going to drug see. test you if you're moving Oklahoma or Ohio State from the loss category to toss-up or or even win. Uh, please don't drug test me. Okay, we're going to go with <laughs> Northwestern, Schmitty. I, I, for some reason, I have a really good feeling about the Northwestern game. Um, and you had that. <laughs> you're in the, it. You had. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, but you're it. You had that in your toss-up category, Northwestern. Cause, just because it always is. It is. It really is. What is, do you know our record against them since we joined the big? Let's go through this. Uh, well, year one, you lost after you beat Michigan State, right. 28-25. We've lost here at home, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Last time you ranked in the top 10 under Bo. So you lost in, in 2011. In 2012, I don't know if you played. I, you've played them every year, haven't you? You have a winning record against them, but it's like eight and six, or that's. We beat them by one in Evans did that year. Yes. Yeah. Last yep. second. Tariq Allen, corner of the end zone. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you had back to back road weekends where you're on ABC primetime. And what happened? You have a last second win on the road against Sparty and against Northwestern. So, yes, yeah, 29 28. Wow. Right? And, the, and then we beat them in 2013. Hail Mary. That's right. Yeah. Hail Mary. We kicked their butt. 2014, yeah, 38 mm-hmm. 17. So that's three, three and one. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah, yes. you're three and one. And then. They beat you in 15 at the black uniform game in overtime. That's right. Again, with Riley. Uh, 2016, you went up there and smoked them in the Stormtrooper White game. Love those unis. Those were good. I like those. 2017, they beat you in Lincoln. That's right. And it, Another that, overtime? Oh, man. that was, I, I was at that game. One of the few games I went to that you year. You and Captain Morgan were there. That was one of the only overtime games I've seen at Memorial Stadium. And then 2018, you blow a 10-point lead. Oh, they God. tie you, go to overtime. Wow. 2019, the worst offensive football game in history, allegedly. You win with a walk-on kicker, getting it through somebody's outstretched pinky. For the field goal, mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson interception, thirteen to ten, and then last year. Sure. So that's about six and four. Six and four. Yeah. I said the two games over. I said eight and yeah. six, and that's awful math. Well, hey, closer <laughs> than I was, man. No, Northwestern. I don't know. I, I we'll see. I kind of like where I'm thinking there, but um, other, there's one more. Uh, the Michigan State game. Um, how are you? What are you thinking about Michigan State? Do you think they're better than? What what we think or I, th- I think Mel Tucker can coach defense. I think Michigan State they beat Michigan last year. Okay, right. and uh, Mel Tucker beat a unbeaten Northwestern team. Right, mm-hmm. stung them. Yeah, after Northwestern heard how good they were for a week. I I think what what is problematic is if Nebraska gets annihilated by Oklahoma. Do they do they bounce back, or are they going to let Oklahoma beat them twice? And here comes Sparty waiting with a fraternity paddle. Do you think ending the season last year, you know, getting that win against Purdue, and then getting the win at Rutgers, do you think that did something for this season, or do you think it's? I think it's a springboard. I mean, each season's its own, but it's a hell of a lot better going to the off season with a win. Now, I think the big problem here is the fact that everyone was so over it they didn't want to play a bowl game. Right. I think that was garbage. So, yeah, I, I understand where you're saying about Michigan State and Northwestern. Okay, you could move them to wins. They should be wins. I just don't trust the, the circumstance. A lot of football season to talk. Uh, Michigan should be a win in Lincoln, but easier said than done. They're, Michigan's still really damn good. Iowa's good. And then Minnesota, that's really tough, but I think that could flip your season. Definitely. You, you go win up there, and then you get a bye. Uh, after eight straight weeks. I have a feeling that the Minnesota game is just going to be a dogfight. Well, last year it was. I mean, Minnesota's Minnesota's like crafty, sneaky good. So that's where I'm at. You would move Northwestern and Michigan State into the win column? Yeah, I think so. But do you agree that Illinois is a toss-up? 
Yep. One, I think, honestly, other than Buffalo and uh, obviously Fordham, Fordham and Purdue, I think the rest are, are toss-ups, to be honest, other than the uh, Michigan State and Northwestern. Yeah, yeah and, we'll, and we'll see what Wisconsin's like by the end of the year. On its face right now, there you go. You can agree, disagree, give me your toss-ups, give me your wins, give me your losses. Chris said... HailVarsity.com. Find us on Twitter at Willie on the Radio, Will Wilson, Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio. Numbers to get in today, 466 3776, 466 3776 800, 825 5865. But let's get back to that 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 pucker factor, that moment, that that tension, that tightness when it's tight ball games. I bring that up because of Bo Pelady and his sit down with Will Compton. So we covered a lot of, of the, the pod busting with the boys and Bo's sit down. Uh, I want to get your thought here uh, from Bo and Will react to this. And Will said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to say what I think Bo did wrong, right? There's a lot of good he did. If you ask his former players, there's some things that we can all get better at, and Will got got real and was respectful to Coach Pelini. I think when we were in the big moments and Bo would get pissed off, Bo was our like leader. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Bo was the guy where you knew when he was talking to the media. It was always it felt like uh, you know, our backs were against, you know, the nation of Nebraska, basically. Like it was us versus them. Like you always wanted to make you guys versus fans. Yeah. Bo was like the head of mm-hmm. all of it. So anytime we had a team meeting, everybody's tripping outside the walls, outside the building. You knew you were going to go in a team meeting and hear some juice from Bo. Like he's going to give us something. He's going to get our heads right. We're all going to be good. When you get in tough parts of the game and Bo, from stories I hear, blacks out and doesn't necessarily remember how much he like gets after people. Yeah. But when Bo gets pissed off and you feel like the fan and you feel like you're letting everybody down, I feel like that festers into a young kid's psyche. And then you play more yeah. to not mess up. That's that's uh, such a good take. And if you're young in the program, are you playing to win or are you playing not to lose? How tight are you playing? And what's your fear factor like going to that sideline if you do screw up? They're going to talk about the Wisconsin game in 2014 where Melvin Gordon ran for a NCAA record 408 yards. Nebraska was up 17 to 3 in that game. Nebraska was only down 24 to 17. You want to do yourself like just a uh, a masochistic act exercise? Go look at Nebraska's offensive possessions in the second half. Of that Nebraska 2014 loss to Wisconsin. I mean, they 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 were three and out all second half or they were turnovers and it went from a 7-point deficit being up by 14 to 59-24. But the the Wisconsin game specifically circled here. When I noticed it watching from afar was probably the Wisconsin game where you guys were 7 and 0 or 8 and 1. You guys were at their house. I yeah, mean, you're up I'm, like 17 nothing. You're up 17 nothing <laughs> and um or 17 3 at the time. And Melvin Gordon jumps over Corey Cooper and goes to the end zone. And you see you just going in. And I'm thinking from my stance, like, these dudes are up 17-10 going into halftime against a team that we need to, this is our time to come back. Like, they've obviously had our number every year. Like, we're in it. Like, we don't, you know, there don't need to be any red ass being spread around. It's more of like a corral thing. <laughs> That's a moment where I felt like, you know, you remember certain things like that. <laughs> they need a hug, not a verbal beating. <laughs> Oh, that was so good. That was so good. But it's true. That makes sense. Think about it, man. I mean, and like Saban, listen, Saban gets away with being Saban because he's cranking out national title after national title. But he's no different. When it goes sideways, like when Clemson drilled them in the national title game, he lost it. And and he acted like a a, a toddler in the toy aisle who didn't get his toy. It was it was Toy IL fit time, right? You're going to go ballistic. And, and Saban does. But for the most part, he's, he's pretty measured. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald like, will get stern and lose it once in a while in, in the press conference setting as far as how he's talking about his team's performance. Like he just, There's just a different tone with him. 
So Will was pretty much saying, "There's already enough pressure on these kids from the you know the fans." Bo was just kind of adding to it in this sense, right? And man, I need you to step forward and and, and be my daddy. I need you to be my leader. <laughs> Legit, when it's going sideways, you losing it and going psycho isn't gonna isn't gonna make it better. It's gonna make us worse, and and that's totally fair. And Bo was like, "Yeah," and and I think Will also pointed to the fact where. Dude, you're, you're playing for a title at, at Youngstown, and you had a, you had a defeatist mentality because there was, a, there was a really horrible call against you. You let that mushroom into, we have no shot at winning this. So I thought that was pretty fascinating for Will Compton to say. And that was his demeanor and his behavior were a lot of the reason for the anti bow crowd clearly but it was addressed by will compton as to here's like one complaint we have as players where and man you talk to his former staff and, and they to a man will say yeah he goes to some place him and carl would go to some place during a game where they were so high strung that it was will ferrell check that it was yeah it was will ferrell in old school like answering the uh, the question where he had a momentary blackout and talked about the That's world, how you debate the world global economy. It just was the other way for Bo. He'd black out and he'd scream at people. We'll uh, check in with Mitch Sherman next. The Tale of Our City presented by the Nebraska Lottery. We're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back to you, Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Gary Barnett, 35 minutes away, get his take on how he won the vaunted rib off against his rival from Nebraska. We welcome in Mitch Sherman from The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, thanks for moving days. Uh, Salvi Perez is incredible. I've always kind of known this, but I got to see it Tuesday night. Yeah, did he hit a, hit a home run while you were there? Uh, two, almost three. Two. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night, I was, uh, I was watching Bobby Wood Jr. at uh, Warner Park, and he also hit a home run, so he'll be in the lineup soon with Salvi Perez. That'll be nice for Kansas City because they could use uh, some more pop. But uh, no, Salvi crushed a couple. That was that was fun to, to get down to Kansas City. So, what's up with you? Uh, how's your week been? What are you uh, What are you reading tea leaves wise here with Nebraska? Is they're they're about ready to wrap up a second week? Yeah, we're two weeks away from. Uh... We're two weeks away from a football game. We're close to it. That seems hard to believe, but, you know, camp is getting past the midway point now. I mean, certainly if you count that last week before the Illinois game as, as game week, which it, it is, and not camp, then we're, we're far past the midway point. Um, it's time for decisions to be made or past time for decisions to be made. If you listen to and go back to the comments that Scott Frost made at the end of July about accelerating some things, in camp this year. I thought yesterday was probably the most insightful day so far because the majority of the intrigue here with this team lies on the offensive side. Defensively, I think we know what Nebraska is, is going to give people. Uh, the starting lineup is not really a, a surprise. We know there's depth. Um, you know, really maybe one position that's somewhat unsettled right now, and, and you kind of know the contenders at, the, at that spot, I'm talking about the corner position mm-hmm. opposite Cam yep. Taylor Britt. So, um, but offensively, a lot of questions, and, and you know what, we didn't get answers from Ryan Held and Mario Verduzco. Um, th- there were indications that these things are coming into focus. I wrote about that today, but before then having the chance to talk to Trev Alberts uh, this morning about um, a number of, of things that were. Uh, you know, that are on the minds of, uh, uh, of him as, as uh, you know, an athletic director less than one month on the job. So a lot in these last 24 hours, actually, starting, I guess, with the uh, um, mysterious situation at tight end and, mm-hmm. and, and then um, moving on to the running backs and the backup quarterback. Mitch, I want to go to the tight ends for a second, and I don't know that, that Scott will say anything tomorrow 
uh, injury wise, but that's the, mm-hmm. the the smoke that's in the atmosphere with uh, with Nebraska's two top tight ends uh, again. Mm-hmm. Just what's swirling around. If that is a reality, is Nebraska they they have to adjust, but do they adjust with uh, you know a four wide setup or I mean how, mm-hmm. what what do they what do they what do they turn to offensively because it, it sounded like there's gonna be a lot of tight end use and there still could yeah. be but it, it wouldn't be as as familiar I guess is what I'm saying. Well, you know we don't know we don't know how bad or or if. Even right. the, the, the it's significant. Um, just know that Travis Vokalek and Austin Allen were not there yesterday, mm-hmm. and that that's that's really it. So I agree, I'm with you. I don't expect to get much of an answer from from Frost tomorrow. Really, he only comments on those kind of things uh, if it's a season ending or a long term kind of injury. And if if there's not an injury, um, this is a way for him to create a little bit of suspense. Certainly Illinois has that in their favor, a lot of suspense, even what the scheme's going to be in a couple of weeks in Champaign. So for Nebraska to, to, to generate some of that is not, not a bad thing. I and mean, certainly you're not going to uh, fake an injury. Um, I'm not right. suggesting that he held those guys out for that reason. They were out for a, a real reason. But um, if, if it's a minor um, or, or even, even not really an injury-related type of situation, I don't expect that that he's going to say much more than than uh, you know they're working through some stuff. So, which is about as vague as you can get. So, um, you know, Chris Hickman has got a lot of praise, has received a lot of praise this this uh, preseason from Sean Becton and 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 from Matt Lubick um, for the work that he's done and 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 moving back to tight end full time. He's shuffled shuttled back and forth between tight end and receiver in his couple years in Lincoln and, and now he looks set as, as a tight end you know you sure would like to have Thomas Bedoni right now and that injury looms large from the spring um, you know what a storyline it would be if, if he had been healthy and, the, and then and then pressed into into, uh, into big time duty and against the Big Ten team in, in his college debut but that's not to be um, his debut is, is at least a couple of months away um, with that that ACL recovery. So yeah, I mean, if if uh, if Nebraska's down some tight ends in the opener, um, they're deep at receiver, and I think you could see definitely some three and four wide. You're already going to have three wide receiver sets. You can see some four, maybe five wide receiver sets, some more backs. Um, you know, in the in the backfield, there's definitely options for Nebraska. There are skilled players who are untested, but but have had strong off seasons who can step in. It's just it's going to hurt you. Um, with your ability to, uh, to to block in the run game because they're not going to be as big a guys. And then those tight ends present some matchup problems that, um, you know, an extra receiver on the field won't be able to do. Mitch Sherman's with us from The Athletic, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, uh, a thought on the, on the running back race, uh, a name that we have been wanting to hear more about. We, we got some info from Coach Held, and Savion Morrison uh, appears mm-hmm. to, to have made a bit of a move. Which uh, you know, there's there's a lot of talent. When he was recruited out of Oklahoma, you've got Step, of course, and then you've got Irvin. Any any guess on your end with with who may be uh, leading the, the race right now at running back? I don't know if there really is a leader between those three. I mean, there probably is, but sure. it's hard to characterize anyone as 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 a leader. I think they all bring uh, certain elements, and that's why I'm intrigued by that trio. In general, because you know Savion is the slasher for sure uh, of that group. Step is the downhill guy with the experience, and you know he can move the chains. I think he's your best bet as a short yardage guy um, if if you're working mainly with with those three. Although Ryan Held said there were four, so if Jacquez Yant fits into that mix, then he's also a, a chain mover. And and Gabe Irvin, you know he does a little bit of it all. I mean he looks like a guy who can be a power back, but he's also shown some 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 wiggle. Um, he's shown the ability to catch the ball out of the backfield and look natural doing it. He's really improved his pass protection um, in the off season. So it's possible that he's the most complete guy. And man, he looks like a big 10 running back right now as a true freshman. And that's the biggest concern right there is that he's a true freshman and to throw him in and say, okay, you're going to be the workhorse on August 28th. You know, that's really, that's really, I think running the risk that he's going to hit a wall at some point um, and not be uh, as, as, as ready when you get to that that real hard stretch of your schedule in November. Obviously, you need to think about week zero and not worry about November right now when you play your best players. And if he's one of your 
if he's your best running back, then he plays. But I also think it's important to uh, you know consider that it's a long season and that you have other options and that they they do seem to have other good options. Um, so I, I think it'll be by committee. And if somebody gets the hot hand among that group, then they're going to get a lot of carries. But um, this is not necessarily like last year, where if Nebraska – well, I, I felt like last year Nebraska needed to find a way when he was healthy to get Dedrick Mills the ball a lot, like and get him going and try to get him 20 carries. And that's not really how I feel about these three. I think they, they, they all complement each other and can bring something to the table that makes Nebraska's running game really dynamic and diverse. And, uh, you know, that may be the story throughout the season. Mitch, uh, Folks need to go read your sit down with Trev Alberts uh, on The Athletic uh, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter is where you find Mitch as well. But a uh, little teaser here with uh, with your Trev sit down and Trev's been awesome to, to communicate with. And mm-hmm. I, know, I know he's real anxious for, for this season to, to get going and to, ha- to see Nebraska have some success. But uh, what, what were some of your takeaways with your sit down? I caught up with Trev this morning when he was leaving football practice. Um, he got out there for about 20 minutes. He's still commuting from Omaha. They're, they're moving down. His, his wife and, and one daughter left at home are moving down to Lincoln here soon. Um, you know, he was joking about how it wasn't a, uh, a good uh, – maybe not joking, but he was telling me how it's not a good real estate market right now. So <laughs> It's not. Um, <laughs> Unless you so They're having a hard time finding somewhere to, uh, to get to move into. I know a lot of people are feeling sorry for him. And uh, – um, and, and, and he was headed over to the Devaney Center to uh, to sit down with Pablo Morales, the Nebraska swimming coach. He's, he's doing that with all of the head coaches uh, in Lincoln, um, meeting them on their on their ground. You know, they're not coming over to Memorial Stadium to sit in Trev's office. He's going to to where they are and seeing seeing all these men and women in their um, in their in their spots in their space, as he said, which I think is really cool and, and the sign of a you know an AD who understands you know what he's got to do. Um, to uh, you know, to 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 do his job well. Um, so you know, we talked about the sellout streak. Um, we talked about Nebraska's uh, you know his indoctrination in, in an interesting time in college athletics. Um, you know, he came in and two days later, um, Texas and Oklahoma left the Big Twelve, which you know seemingly has nothing to do with Nebraska. But you know, there's there's dominoes and ramifications all over college sports, as you know, as a result of that, and will be for years. So we talked about some of that. Um, his thoughts on the the, uh, the the bid to extend the sellout streak, which is not a done deal at this point, with that game only three three plus weeks away against Fordham on September fourth, they're still trying to sell tickets. Um, he had some interesting thoughts there, um, expanding a little bit on what he said in, in Indianapolis about that. And we talked about, you know, I, I wish this wasn't even a topic anymore, but it is. You know, the pandemic is is going on, and it, there's cases going up as as everybody knows all over the place. Nebraska's of course, still planning to have a full stadium. Um, they're they're setting protocols on how to deal with COVID this year, um, on how to try to uh, get their vaccine numbers where they want um, with this football team. And uh, you know, he was he was open and and thoughtful and willing to answer every question I, I had to, to ask, except the the question about where Nebraska's at exactly with its, with its vaccine rates. He mm-hmm. he said that that. Uh, um, he's pleased with the progress and that they've made a lot, they've, they've done a lot of work since, uh, since the end of July. So, um, uh, yeah, I would encourage people to take a look at it too. There's a lot there from Trev. Uh, we talked for about a half hour this morning. Well, Mitch, uh, about 40 seconds, you have a uh, field of dreams, uh, tonight, major league baseball. Uh, where does that movie rank in, in Mitch Sherman's baseball, b- baseball movie ranking? Yeah, I love it. It's, it's up there. I haven't seen it in a long time. I may need to watch the game tonight and then, and then, uh, and then find a way to see Field of Dreams, you know, find it on, uh, on some streaming service. Uh, great movie. You know, all Kevin Costner baseball movies are good. Um, it's, it's in the top five for sure. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't pay 1400 bucks or $2,000 $2, or whatever <laughs> it costs to get into that, into that stadium in Iowa tonight, but, but uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll gladly sit down and watch it on TV. Mitch, have a good weekend, bud. We'll see you soon, and thanks for the time today. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, Mitch Sherman with us, Sale Varsity Radio. Uh, we'll get to some of your calls here in a little bit, but uh, more on Trev and, and Mitch's sit down and that sellout streak in Fordham. 275, is it in question? Right now it is. Hail Varsity continues presented by the Nebraska Lottery.
Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. 25 minutes, we'll check in with Gary Barnett, Brandon Vogel, Danny Burke, Hour 2. Many thanks to Mitch Sherman. Find that whole interview on ESPNLincoln.com, the on-demand section for Hale Varsity, or on Twitter with uh, at ESPNLincoln, at ESPNLincoln.com, Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson. So let's get into uh, a part of Mitch's sit-down with Trev Alberts, specifically the sellout streak. Uh, so a couple of quotes here from Mitch's story uh, from Trev pleasantly surprised by the response from the Nebraska community in helping uh, no seat go unsold. And uh, Trev went on to say that, look, I, I've heard from a lot of our fans and they want to ensure that that sellout streak continues and they want to do their part. If someone buys tickets to me, it's sold out. So that's not a new thing. You've had businesses and friends of the program for a while, and I, I don't know how long it dates back to when it started, uh, if it was Politi, if it was Frank, if it was Riley, wh- whatever. But you had, you had friends of the program uh, would, would buy the surplus seats. And some of those are, are out of Nebraska's hands because you, you allot, what, 4,000, 5,000 seats to the visiting team. Those always aren't sold out, so they're re-released, and then you go snatch them up. So... When it comes to the the streak, it's very important to the program. And he also recognizes it won't go on forever. And it's probably untouchable. Say it stops at 275, God forbid. But, and, and people are, there's two takes on it. One, who cares? It's, it's a different and new era of college football and the program's not that good. It just needs to die. Or you cling to it as a Nebraska fan because that is, that's your way of, of showing support. You travel, you go on the road, you're part of the Big Red Army, you do everything uh, with, with your, your passion and your, your finances. And some of you, you, you've had enough until it gets turned around. You're just not going to invest anymore emotionally. And that's not being fair weather. That's being, dude, I've, I, I've, been beaten down for for 20 years of this thing going downhill compared to the golden era. It's kind of a happy medium there. The 11 o'clock kickoff against Fordham, eh, not great, but it's still a a fall morning. (laughs) Okay, there's worse things to be doing. And and other people have found better things to do, right? They they can't take it. Here's my, here's like my guarantee for whatever that is worth. Two cents, half a penny, whatever. Nebraska beats Illinois. Right, Nebraska comes back to Lincoln from Champaign, one and zero. Fordham will be sold out. Great insight there, I know, but it's just kind of a gut take. This is straight up the wait and see mode. Nebraska fans are in. They want to see Nebraska go play clean, good football, and beat a team that they're air quote supposed to beat. That happens. They'll be there for you with uh, with butts in the seats for Fordham. Well, even I, even at eleven o'clock, they start out zero and one and look like crap, and beat themselves. <laughs> People are gonna just check out. They'll tune in to see if things are going all right. But as far as driving down or making sure fifteen rows are handled, they won't. They won't. They won't do it. Yeah, we lose to Illinois. People actually maybe go to that wedding on Saturday. Yeah. Yes. Right and. <laughs> I was one of those guys who, you know, I'll be celebrating 18 blissful years uh, this September 27th. That that said, I mean, I I scheduled my wedding during a bye week. There you go. Thank you, Bill Byrne. Uh, forever and ever, I'm in. So, listen, the growth needs to happen with the program. And, and Trev's been very straightforward. Part of the growth that you need to be honest with ourselves, warts and all, at the end of the day, if the reality doesn't match the perception, I'm not the guy who's going to keep the perception going. <laughs> if the reality is folks aren't shelling out their money anymore to go see a football team that, that may or may not get to 500 in some people's minds, then I'm not going to continue this, this lipstick. Good for him. 
Yeah. Good for him. Uh-huh. That's totally fair. Let's let's be authentic. Mm-hmm. From and, the from the fan though, you know, it seems like that's kind of all we got. Is the a sellout, sellout streak. streak. Like, what else do we have to kind of, uh, you know... Hang your hat on? Yeah. What do you got to cheer about? You got to cheer about baseball and volleyball right now. Sure. Okay. And yeah. and and there's a lot of hope and hype for basketball, which is all good. Mm-hmm. And then there's this deliver now, please kind of mentality in football. You tell me this. You're just out of college. And what what is the priority list for Will Wilson to get... A pair of season tickets. Ooh. Now, listen, I grew up going to them. You grew up going to games. We were pretty yeah. both pretty blessed with ma- that being a part of our football and our family Saturdays. Honestly, outside of work, you know, with if I had no obligations, I would want to go to probably every game. You, you would still, yeah, because mm-hmm. you grew up with it. Right. Right? And, and right now, like in our family, I didn't think I'd see a day where – Joe Mama, my mom, would be able to get four seats in a row. Mm. Wow. Two weeks before the season, or whenever the 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 pick three came out, probably a few weeks back. It's turned into a blur this summer. Right. Yeah. But she she had to get four in a row for Northwestern, for Iowa, for Michigan. <laughs> when the hell's that happened? Yeah, Michigan and Iowa wow. coming to town. You got Northwestern night ball game. Yeah, I would like uh, four together in the north end zone for my three knucklehead headed grandkids and, and me. Yeah. And, and and make sure that you're serving a Bloody Mary every five minutes till I pass out hey, to maybe, put up with them. Maybe that's it, Schmitty. Maybe they just got to get booze year-round. Then people will go to Dude, games. Dude, the party deck that K-State's doing is, is I cool. I got that. That's, that's kind of the next thing. Is getting the it, fan entertainment. Get, get me, yeah. get me a party deck. Shrink the stadium. Make money. I, I know ninety thousands. Like you're walking into the boardroom and you're 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 driving a wheelbarrow where, with with crowd size. I get it, but you shrink it. You make it a little bit more comfortable. Hell, maybe add some more suites somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Just talking out loud, but you give me a party deck, man. Yes. Give me a party deck. Get me a hot tub from Deb the Spa Lady. Get me, uh, get me a, 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 a red beer station mm-hmm. and, and hook me up with uh, some booze, some beer on tap. Mm-hmm. Have a good old time. Make it a party. And the game itself should be the party, I understand. Well, entertainment's changing. What's going to keep the attention? Mm-hmm. And a, 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 a hot tub club. Like and, a tubbery, yeah. Like a tub? Yeah. That would be money. That would be, yeah, make the donors pay big for that. There you go. Well, yes. As in getting access to it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Clarify. You know, it just gets, it it can get creepy with hot tubs and donors. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? Around uh, different programs, for sure, for sure. (laughs) Uh, Gary Barnett is on the way in 15 minutes. We will dive into baseball in Iowa. And the uh, Vegas betting line on on best baseball movies. Did you cry at the end of Field of Dreams? It was close. Did you? But I did not. Did you? I kind of cry now. Not going to lie. All right. We'll wind down our one. Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And now... And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Wind down our one, Hail Varsity, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson. Find us, follow us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt at uh, Willie on the radio for Will Wilson on Twitter. Reminder to buckle up. There's over 1,500 crashes each year in Nebraska involving an impaired driver driving drunk, buzzed, or high. Never acceptable. Law enforcement officers working every day to stop it before more people are killed or injured. If you're going to drive, don't drink. If you do drink, designate a sober driver or get a ride share. A DUI costs more than you think. Brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So, Will, let's dive into... The uh, the best baseball movies of all time set by Points Bet Sportsbook. So plus one ten. 
The favorite is Bull Durham, mm. followed by the Sand Va- Sandlot. Then is Field of Dreams. I'm mean, gonna I, I, listen. I I just didn't like. I just didn't say I didn't like, but I don't care that much about League of Their Own. Yeah. Just I mean, Madonna was in it, and at the time that was kind of great. And yeah. then Tom Hanks was in it, and I thought the cast was all right, but I just. There's something for me. It was Tom Hanks that kind of turned me off of that movie. See, I love Tom. It was, that was the first time you ever saw Tom Hanks as an a hole. Okay, right as a character. Yeah, or maybe ever. Sure, sure. Except for when he was a hitman in uh, Road to Perdition. So Sandlot's money. Love that movie. Bull Durham's great. Love it. Money. I I really love Moneyball. Me too. That's, I can that's watch kind it. Of, that's kind of mine. And, and yeah. Field of Dreams is is really cool. Eight Men Out was kind of weird to me, kind of hard to follow in a sense. I know the history of the story of it, mm-hmm. but I don't know. It was kind of, I don't know. Eh. I liked Eight Man Out. See, okay. Cobb, Cobb is not on here. And Tommy Lee Jones plays a psycho like no other uh, portraying Ty Cobb. I got to see that. So it, it's about 30 years old. It's pretty good. Bench Warmers should not be on the list, but it's Junior's one of Junior's favorite movies. It's a classic. And and if I'm you know covered up during the winter time with a blankie, he'll ask me how I'm doing, Howie. You know <laughs> how the the character Howie in there. That movie's got a couple three parts that are just hilarious. Yeah. Major League needs to be higher on the list. It's great. It's timeless. Joe Boo. Yeah. What do you think of the second one? Uh, I try not to. Okay. I try. I, I black out. Major League Two. The rookie is that with the uh, Dennis Quaid? Yeah, I think so. Where's the, where's the high school coach that goes and pitches for the for the Rays because mm-hmm. they needed the, the lefty? The original Bad News Bears is sweet. Yeah, it's not politically correct at all, it's but it's phenomenal. Time. Right. Buttermaker and his uh, rip off beer tops. That was great. I think we got to re-rank these. For love of the game, what'd you think of that one? Hated it. Really? Yes. Hated it because I went with my wife, girlfriend at the time, and I was expecting if Kelly Preston's in it to put on my snout for a moment. Sure. I was expecting Kelly Preston in a similar role romantically ah. to what I got in Jerry Maguire. Fair enough. Right? Yeah. If you're going to go to some freaking love story and she thinks it's a great idea because it's a sports movie and you'll like it, you know it's going to suck. Okay? It's just where I'm at with it. We'll take more of your calls on this. The Bad News Bears needs to be up the list. Major League Baseball is probably top two. Bull Durham's money. Anybody going to Iowa tonight? Let's see. Other question. Who's dropping 2G? <laughs> to watch the Yanks and the White Sox. Uh, that was a hard no to Junior. No. Hour two coming up, Hail Varsity. Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402 466 ESPN or 1 800 825 5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it, Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Will Wilson. We welcome in the Hall of Fame coach and uh, rib off champion 2021, <laughs> Gary Barnett with us. Coach, how are you? I'm doing well, Chris. What's going on in Nebraska? Man, just trying to figure out who's going to be running the football or the two guys going to be running the football. But you know what? How, how long – let me ask you, are you still wearing the apron? <laughs> no, no. I, I put it away after the big contest. We'll have another one next year. So That's awesome. We, we did a little quality control to see why, why we won or why we lost, and uh, we'll put that in the books. I keep a chart of every every time I cook the ribs and – and grade myself. So uh, now the, the the aprons put away. You you got to see the the picture of I did of uh, uh, Bob Churchich and myself. He had a big Nebraska in on his uh, his wife made those for us, by the way. And then I had a CU on my uh, black apron. So it was a lot of fun. There needs to be with the rematch with Bob, uh, Coach. 
the loser next year has to wear the other guy's apron. Oh. That is very good. The Nebraska I'm apron, that the, Nebraska, the Nebraska apron, or the Colorado apron. There you go. That's pretty good. So I'm, I'm just. We'll spend two more seconds on barbecue. You went grill with these, correct? We did. We uh, uh, Bob's got a Traeger. I don't have. I, I've got a Traeger down in uh, Arizona, but I don't have one here. Sure. So we went grill with these. Yeah. Well, there's a little sauce on them. They are. Uh, they are baby back, and they were phenomenal. There's the stoic picture of Coach Barnett. I'm scrolling through my phone here uh, with the grill top open. You got a frosty one on you. That's incredible. And, uh, and, and folks were, were tweeting in wondering if this is open to the public. <laughs> Well, you know, if it becomes a bigger deal, we might open it up and, uh, you know, and raise some money for charity that, or something. That'd be awesome. You do a charity fundraiser. We'll yeah, find our we way to... Yeah, we could do that. That's a good Boulder. idea. Yeah, to do, a, to do a roadie to Boulder again. That'd be fun. And so the judges scored this thing 62-36. <laughs> well, it, we didn't have that many judges, but uh, as it turned out, the percentage of of uh, votes that I got, the percentage of votes that he got ended up being equivalent to a 62 to 36 victory. You know, and and I thought based on that that judges the the number the ratio there you go 62 to 36 coach Barnett wins in the rib off. So hey, we're uh, we're just two weeks from football, Nebraska, Illinois. I'm going to ask you, you know, if you're if you're coach Bielema, let's go from that end first, and. You, you inherit a team that, that Lovey put together that is pretty good on the lines of scrimmage. They're very physical. There's some guys that can hit defensively. A quarterback that's been around the league and, and Peters. What do you do? Or do you just kind of come in with camp, with your system? Because I'm trying to remember what Brett did at Arkansas. I know it was downhill and I formation and power, but... Maybe you can or can't do that uh, with, uh, with with Illinois. How do you approach that if you're Bielema here with this first game? Well, Bielema's going to put his system in, and he doesn't care if this is the first game or the last game. Uh, he's going to he's going to employ his system. You know, he, the wrinkles he has in will depend on his talent and and uh, the kind of players he has. But his system will be his system, and he's a, a one tight end, two tight end guy downhill run, um, you know, play good defense. Ryan Walters, the defensive coordinator, is, uh, is from Missouri and, and played for me, actually. His dad played for me, too, at, at Colorado. So uh, I know what Ryan's going to do, but um, Bielema is going to be a he, – he's going to rely on the offensive line. He's an old offensive lineman. He loves offensive linemen. He's, they're going to be – very physical in the trenches before it's all over. I'm not sure they'll be that way this year, but before it's all all over, that's what it's going to look like for them. So he's going to put his system in and, and uh, fit everybody into it right now. Gary Barnett's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Let's flip it around to, uh, to Nebraska. And, Coach, what – what what did you – how did you make it through camp when it comes to, to injuries? How did you – how did you treat that? How did you navigate that element, that worry, that fear that some of your some of your top tier guys, because you want to be physical, may get dinged? Well, it's it's uh, it was probably the the thing that was the hardest for me in all of college football was injury management and knowing just when to pull off and when to put the pressure on. And you, you know, I got to where in the last couple of years of my career, I would. I would I would end periods a minute early just because I didn't want to take a chance on getting somebody hurt. And you know this game this this game has a lot more pressure on on Nebraska than it does on Illinois. And uh, I mean this is a must win game for for Scott. And it's um, you know you just you, you, you it's a fine line between pushing them far enough to get the work done and. And getting better, and and pulling back so that you you got everybody there for the game, and it's it's an art, it's not a science, and um, you know you go on your gut instinct a lot. Um, you know you've you've got some players that have 
are coming off of injuries and you want to be careful with them and so you do sort of a pitch count with them They're, you're only going to play them so many reps per day I know Colorado's got a great linebacker Nate Landman that's coming off Achilles surgery and they've done a pitch count with him They're, you know, I don't care how good he is and how important he is he's only going to play so many plays per practice and mm-hmm. I think it, it's a mixture of all that sort of stuff Chris Coach, what do you know about about uh, Matt Lubick uh, from seeing him at Oregon and in Washington in the in the Pac-12 and his influence, what it could be? And I know he was here last year, and last year was just such a screwy year with COVID and what was open and what you could see. But overall, you know, what what do you think he can bring uh, and, and complement to, to what Scott's already been doing? Well, his experience, uh, his experience, uh, you know, at Oregon with Scott, um, you know, he's got a year under his belt with Adrian Martinez and with the, with everybody there. Uh, that's going to help a lot. It's a lot, you know. He he. This isn't just a year advantage. It's more than a year advantage on a, on someone like uh, Bielema going into uh, Illinois and trying to put his team together. This is. This is a veteran guy that's worked with the coach before. He, he's gotten a year under his belt with his system and what he wants to do. And so, you know, they've always been very productive on offense, very explosive on offense. Um, you think of Oregon and you really, you really think of how wide open they are, but in reality they are a run team. And when you when you look at look at them and really evaluate what they do, they are great at running the football. And I mean, they had backs every year that were, you know, were 1,500 yard rushers. And so it it looks like it's there's a lot of uh, uh, flair out there, but in reality, they run the football and they're very very physical. Nebraska is in the midst of, of trying to, to find a, a back, and uh, you've got kind of a four-horse race right now. You've got the transfer uh, marquee step, and I think you've seen him when he was healthy. When he was at USC, he was kind of their downhill back, uh, had a good game against Notre Dame, transferred to, to Nebraska. Savion Morrison, a high-profile kid out of Oklahoma. Gabe Irvin, uh, a, a young pup that came in early. That has wowed, and and from a style standpoint, steps more. You're downhill. You've got Morrison as the slasher, and Irvin can kind of do it all. He's got some wiggle. He's got some power, and uh, according to some reports, was able to hit a home run in, in one of their first scrimmages last weekend. So he could take it to the house. You know, if you're Ryan Held, the running backs coach, and this, this offense, you want to find one guy and go with him versus the committee that's not bore a lot of fruit. What's that like from from your recollection going through and, and helping determine who you're going to lean on with some guys that, that may not have a lot of separation uh, from 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 good to great? They they or you don't know the unknowns there because they've not seen the field. Well, I don't think you try to lean on anybody. I I, I think it, you just play what you got. And you, you've got to play a lot of backs. That's just the nature of the game. And you look at Oregon; they they were always a two, three, and four back uh, system, and and all their backs shared. And, uh, you, you know, the system was such that every back got to show what he does. And so, I don't think you worry about having one guy. I mean, I I think the Nebraska mentality through the years is you have one back, you have an eye back, mm-hmm. you know. And but I don't think that exists anymore, especially in Lubick's system. And Scott's system, so I I don't think you worry about that. You got play the three or four guys that you got. If you got three or four, that's great. But you're going to need them all before the season's over. Did you ever struggle with with not letting a guy get lathered up, or or did you struggle with maybe not uh, not going to to the bullpen soon enough? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is that that balancing act of of knowing when to uh, to go to another back if someone's doing well or or whatever the situation dictated. <clears throat> No, I, I think you sort of schedule how many times you're going to try to play each guy. Mm-hmm. And then if somebody gets hot, you play them more. But, uh, y- you know, you're, everybody's going to have three, two or three backs that they can play with. Mm-hmm. And it's a pitch count deal a little bit. Because if they run the ball as often as Oregon did or as Washington did, those guys are they're going to get plenty of reps. 
Sure. And uh, so I don't think you worry about that. You try to get you try to get yourself three of them, and and go from there and create some uh, diversity in your attack. Coach, uh, you had Bo Politi sit down with uh, former Husker Will Compton in his podcast this week, and it was pretty insightful. And the the topic of pressure moments came up, and, and Will was speaking pretty candidly to Bo about how his reactions some of the times on the sideline in, in key moments and pressure moments didn't help. Like, there's already enough pressure. Guys felt bad. Are we going to make a play? Are we going to fold? You know, big big momentum moments in a ball game. And then, you know, it's been well documented how, how Bo would react on the sideline. Uh, you always seem pretty even keel. Obviously, you had passion, too, on the sideline. But what did you try and, and carry out with your assistants and your kids when a ball game got tight or momentum swung? Well, we always preached, tried to preach to our guys that you got to stay on an even keel. And, you know, I always, I always felt like there was, you know, a hundred sets of eyes on me every time a response from me was needed. And so I needed to be careful with that. I needed to make sure that my response was what I wanted them to see and feel. Uh, and I was always aware of that. But if you're going to ask your kids to play, uh, to not get too high and not get too low, you've got to operate that same way as a coach. Or otherwise, you're a hypocrite. And they, they see into that. And as a coach, you always want to do what you say you're going to do. And if you don't, then, then you're a failure. So if, if I wanted them to, to act and behave that way, then I needed to act and behave that way. And I, I tried to. I wasn't always great at it, but I, I certainly tried. It was always something I was very conscious of. Were you, would you say you were, you were effective at being calming in some big moments? Well, I hope. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Um, you know, I hope I was. You know, I hope that uh, that nobody came to the sideline afraid to come see me, um, you know, that I wasn't going to overreact. Uh, and at the same time, I, if I needed to say something that everybody needed to see and hear, then I would say it and do it. But I tried to always do it with a level of calm mm-hmm. and reserve and uh, poise that – that I wanted them to have and I wanted them to see. Coach Gary Barnett's with us, Hale Bar City Radio. Coach, uh, we always got to ask, did you play today? And if, if so, what did you shoot? Hey, I did. Chris, I was 37 on the front, 42 on the back, a cool little 79. Look at uh, you. I was disappointed in a lot of my decisions on the backside. So I, uh, you know, I got to work on my decision making. Well, what? Did you, could you, or should you have laid up or did you go for it or did you? You know, uh, what were you, you what, know, what, what, what are you, what are you upset about? Well, there's a couple times when I, I knew the wind was, was a little stiffer than what I wanted it to be. And I should have taken more club and I didn't. And it results in a bogey and, uh, stuff like that. And a, and a couple of putts. I, I, you know, I, I should have been more authoritative with a couple of putts mm-hmm. and I, I sort of quit on one or two and that cost me two strokes. So, you know. Every shot counts, Chris. Every one. How many Skittles did you win today? <laughs> uh, I won two dollars worth of Skittles today. All right, there we go, <laughs> Coach. We'll get. It pu- was enough to pay the guy that cleans my ba- my clubs. Okay, well, good. Two bucks and a little tip. I like it. Well, Coach, congrats on the on the rib off. I mean, that's that's impressive. And uh, thanks for talking some ball. We're getting closer to kickoff, and then we'll uh, get caught up soon. Thanks for the time. You got it, Chris. Thanks. Uh Gary Gary Barnett with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Good stuff from uh, Coach Barnett. I'd love to to get his perspective, you know, kind of in reference to to what Will Compton was talking with Coach Bo about on those sideline moments. And got to be even key. Also got to be right when you pick your spots on how you react. Because it can go the other way. You can be seen as somebody that's just kind of standing there and not engaged in the game with your players. Brandon Vogel's on the way with Hale Varsity. He's in his 30s. 
but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hail Varsity Radio. I got the body of a taut, preteen Swedish boy. Thank you, Kramer. Hour two, it's Hail Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Good stuff from Gary Barnett. That'll be posted on the on-demand section, ESPNLincoln.com, also ESPN uh, Lincoln's Twitter handle, and uh, that'll be up here, if it's not already, by uh, the great Will Wilson. Good stuff from Barney on remaining calm. Uh, great rundown by Brandon Vogel on the black shirt defense. Uh, greed is good. Wonderful line from Wall Street. We say hi to the managing editor for HailVarsity.com and Magazine. And uh, his book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion. Vogues, uh, how greedy can those black shirts be this year? How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, well, hopefully pretty greedy. I, that was kind of one of my takeaways from this big look at the past three years is that, you know, minus last year, which was bizarre in a lot of fronts for a lot of teams, uh, the first two years, Nebraska really kind of put themselves in position for a lot of takeaways and, and actually had a lot. They averaged 1.8 and then 1.7, which anytime you're getting near two takeaways a game, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> the problem is, and this is uh, none of their own doing, is it, you kind of get lost because, well, Nebraska tends to give it, give it back away uh, about that same amount, if not more. So it's a little bit of a sliding scale that works both ways. So they need to be, based on history, they need to be plus three on the the turnover side of things defensively just to offset what the offense could do to be even? (laughs) It's it's been that way in the past. Um, I think uh, everyone who follows Nebraska and certainly those who coach it uh, is is hoping that's not necessarily the case in 2021, but... We'll see. Nebraska, from a giveaways perspective, Nebraska is one of the more bizarre teams of the last 10 to 15 years. Um, it's just, <laughs> they've never quite shaken that bug for, for whatever reason. Uh, so you got a lot of ground to make up defensively if you're counting on uh, counteracting it that way. Can we go into the why? What What's your theory? And Someday I need to ask Barnett this or, you know, another coach. Why can you just be so crazy with hanging on to the football? I mean, if this goes back, this goes back to, this goes back 10 or 15 years with quarterbacks here. I mean, and it's beyond just the, the normal, all right, if you're in a, a Callahan offense and you're throwing the football maybe 50 times or 45 or, you know, if, if the old Zach Taylor, let's just start chucking the ball because you're down 17 uh, and, and you come back to, to make it a ball game. I get it. You're, you're going to have some picks. But Nebraska's had just phenomenal athletes with that dual threat tag, Team Magic, Adrian, and even Tommy. And Tommy was more of a an issue with the interceptions. Not that he was bad, but I don't remember Tommy fumbling a ton. So... But, yeah, the last three quarterbacks you've had here in the non-Riley era have been really problematic. It, but it's been risk and reward because they've made some amazing plays and, and done some incredible things from a total yardage standpoint. Yeah, they, they have. I mean, I've looked at this really in-depth, and I will continue to do so because – it's just it's hard to get it to totally add up, um, you know, and, and and that's somewhat to be expected. Like turnovers are pretty random, particularly fumbles are just like they happen. Um, why has Nebraska had more, way more than its its fair share of fumbles when you compare it to other teams over that stretch? And I mean, really, you can go back to the, the start of the Pelini era, and and it's definitely true then. I don't know if I've ever gone so far back as Callahan era, but um, and I think a lot of that is one. You know, quarterbacks are a little bit more. I mean, they handle the ball a lot, so they should have fumbles. But when you put that quarterback into a running situation, it bumps it a little bit more. And then you have, you've had two guys, uh, Taylor and Adrian Martinez, who just for whatever reason have, have been a little bit fumble prone. So, so I think that's a big part of it. The other big thing, at least for the Frost era, 
Um, with interceptions, interception rates go up when you trail. And, and Nebraska has trailed a lot over the past three seasons. And, you know, interceptions aren't the big issue here. It is those fumbles. And, you know, go back to where we started here. Uh, like, what do you do when they, they just happen? Uh, fumbles are maddening to me. I, I, there's a reason I wrote a story a couple of years ago called Fumbles Are Dumb. If we could just get rid of them, uh, I very much would. Here's my take on it. The, we, we highlighted two quarterbacks that have been phenomenal with their, their athleticism, and, and when it's clicking, they are tough to defend and tough to beat. But I guess, folks, the way I look at it is these guys are going to be a focal point of the offense. You're not going to limit them with uh, what they can do with their legs but you're also not going to risk them during practice getting hit. So I think when it comes to Saturdays where there's no green jersey on them, I think there's your answer. I think that's your problem, that guys aren't, aren't getting the same type of contact in the name of saving them for Saturday. And, and there's, your, there's your reason for, you look at the turnover numbers between both, uh, both the Martinez's, I mean, to me, that's your answer. Yeah, I think that, that that plays into it, it particularly the uh, both of those guys are so dangerous as, as running quarterbacks that, you know, it's really hard to say, like, well, we don't want to risk it for the two or three percent of the plays that end up as fumbles. But those fumbles that you do lose, you know, become much more massive. So they don't happen that often, but when they do happen – they tend to be pretty big. I mean, turnovers, uh, all turnovers are, are less than 2% of all plays, but you can look at turnover margin at the end of every game, and you've probably got the winner just 80% of the time based on whoever won that turnover battle. They're, they're massive. Vogue's a thought on the, the running back race and uh, Coach Held. I know we talk about running backs quite a bit. I want to go a little further and uh, some takeaways, an impression from Held as you watched his presser yesterday. Yeah, I mean, the guy that jumped out to me as much as the, the position coach in the room was, was Marty Stepp. You know, our, our first chance to really hear from him. I, I appreciated his frankness with um, talking about why, why Nebraska appealed to him and why he chose to use, leave USC. Um, Talking about they threw it 50 times a game, which wasn't quite true, but it was pretty close. I think they were, they were second nationally in, in passing attempts per game last year. So I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, he isn't just saying that. Like, he, he really looked looked through it and, and thought about it. So, you know, I got, a, I got a really good sense of maturity out of him, and I know he's been up there near the top. I mean, if we, we know that there's a top four, Held wouldn't go there and, and say which four, but – you know, based on the guys that spoke yesterday, I think we know three of them for sure. Mm-hmm. And, and Step, Urban, um, and Savion Morrison. Two of those guys, we outside of a you know a spring setting, we haven't seen run the football for Nebraska yet. So, yeah, it's a little bit nerve wracking. But at this point, I've kind of processed that Nebraska's running back room is going to feel almost entirely new, um, and it's it's kind of moved more to excitement to see because it, I, I feel like Step might be kind of the I mean, he has the most experience of that group and might be the surest option. So what can kind of Morrison and Irvin potentially bring as a little bit of specialized skill sets? You know, I think you know, a little bit back towards Amir Abdullah, his freshman year, you know, really made an impact on kick return. But he was that perfect, like, you know, going to get six, seven carries a game and, and, and really give you something. If Nebraska's got that, so really they need two guys at minimum, um, they should be in pretty good shape. I formation. Uh, people have <laughs> dove into the, the Nebraska videos that have been released, and if you got a, a dude like Yant maybe leading the way for a guy like Steph, that's some thunder in the backfield. Uh, it's not quite, and this is blasphemous, but it's not quite Weebacks. That's okay. But, hey, give me that identity. Give me I formation and, you know, two tight ends. Now that the, the two tight end part, let's hope that's still possible. But, hey, how about Nebraska maybe morphing into to some downhill I formation? Folks, did, did, did you write that in and was the, was the letter taken to heart? <laughs> I, 
I didn't write that in. And once I, I saw that start to trickle out from practice yesterday, I was like, okay, well, this could become a thing. And, and it, you know, I mean, <laughs> they ran against Ohio State as that change of pace. We get a question in the mailbag this week about who's Nebraska have a better chance to upset, mm-hmm. Ohio State or Oklahoma. Um, and I was mostly joking, although <laughs> I'm honestly kind of intrigued knowing that yesterday they were running some isolation stuff. Uh, I was like, maybe, you know, Army almost went to yes. Norman and beat Oklahoma. Yes. Can can Nebraska go in there and play straight up and, and beat OU? Well, you know, yeah, anything can happen, but they're going to be about a 20-point underdog in that game. So maybe try to shorten the game down a little bit, particularly if you've got this package that, you know, isn't just they put it in yesterday. It's It's been – percolating to some degree, uh, we know, at least since 2019. So let's go back to that Army game. Was that an overtime ball game? I know it was like 21-17, to 17, right? It was 28-21 was the final, and I couldn't – I meant to look it up, and I couldn't remember if it went to overtime or not. I think it – I don't think it did. I think OU just held on at the end there. But, yeah, 28-21, and you know, yeah. Army's the master of this, but they would go on eight- or nine-minute drives. <laughs> yes, the old New York um, Giants special. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, hey, I'd at least think about it. Why not? And man, it it could it could work. Willie uh, is chiming in. Yes, overtime uh, oh, for okay. for Oklahoma. But yeah, I remember watching the Army kids walk off the field because we're in the press box, and OU's fan base has given Army a standing O. Like man, you, you made a sweat. That was a good Oklahoma team too, where they just yeah. held on. They just held on to the football. So, are you going to to watch the Sox? Yanks, I got about 30 seconds, or are you just going to throw in Field of Dreams tonight? <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop in on it. Uh, the, the White, neither the White Sox nor the Yankees are my, my two favorite teams, so I'm going to have to take my medicine there a little bit on that front. But I think it'll be cool. I, I'm, I'm interested to see what it looks like and seeing some of the Twitter reports about what it's like around there right now uh, certainly has, has whet the appetite. Well, legit, the the cars lined up is reminiscent to the end of the movie with folks yep. trying to get in. So it's pretty cool. Brandon Vogel, managing editor with us, HailVarsity.com and magazine, his book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion. Vogels will talk Saturday. Appreciate you much. Thanks so much. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. There he is, Brandon Vogel. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the fumble question. Can... Uh, can that demon be exercised? Best bets on the way. Danny Burke, Pride of Chicago, next with Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Danny Burke, the Pride of Chicago, with this. Burke's Best Bets and Danny's Dimes. You find him on Beeson Sports Network, Rush Hour, his show 6 to 7 all over the nation in the iHeartMedia app. Danny Burke, it's almost Big Ten football time. How are you? You know, Schmitty, I'm doing good. We just keep previewing more and more shows, so that means we're just getting vamped up even more for the season. It's Look, I mean, it's coming sooner than we thought, but that just means we got more work to do, so I'm excited for it. Well, let's dive in to... Uh, some of the Big Ten West. I know we hit on Nebraska last week, and uh, the 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 first six, <laughs> we uh, we kind of settled on. You know, four is the over under. Overall, Nebraska's at that that six. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking Nebraska better be over six. That's just my take. I think they can do it, but there's some coin flip games, and there's a lot of uh, prove it mentality with the fan base. Uh, they'll believe it when they see it. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm going through that later on my show tonight because we've kind of done every single team, and I did want to do Nebraska right away, and, you know, at the risk of being a homer. But, look, you know, I'm as harsh of a critic as anybody on Nebraska, especially when it comes to betting for them or rather against them more so these past couple of seasons. But, look, yeah, we're seeing the win total at about six, slightly shaded to the over. And, you know, honestly, Schmitty, you and I have talked about this, and really the concerns I have with this team – certainly revolve around the skill positions. Now, of course, if you can get a number one receiver who could be your playmaker, I have enough faith in Martinez to get the job done at this point in his career at Nebraska. Running back-wise, 
you know, from what I've been reading, obviously you're a little bit more in depth, but as long as Marquis Stepp gets a little bit healthier, he should be able to be a force on the field as well as the rest of the committee. Tight end position, you're pretty set, but again, you're losing playmakers in terms of the receivers. You need a guy to step up in that category. So that's my biggest concern. Defensively, I'm pretty pumped to see what the black shirts can do. I think this is going to be the best defense in the Frost regime. You need to commit more turnovers. But again, you know, when I look at these win totals, Schmidt, I always like to separate it in winnable, toss up, and losable games. To me, for the games that I put as toss up, I actually put week five at Michigan State as a toss up game just because vintage Nebraska, they're going to make that game tougher than it needs to be. And it's not that I'm high on Sparty, it's more so that I just think Mel Tucker is going to have his guys in a competitive kind of just environment on a game-to-game basis. We kind of saw that last year, too, despite them struggling. Week 7, you get Michigan at home, but the Wolverines are a question mark to me. They could either be really solid or just classic Michigan. Regardless, that's going to be a toss-up game. Then, of course, Week 13 versus Iowa. If you can win against Iowa and or Michigan State, I think they get over 6. But if I'm going anywhere, I would take the over 6. I think they have more of a chance to get 7 wins than they do only winning 5. Danny Burke with us. Burke's Best Bets, the Pride of Chicago, v Sports Network, his show Rush Hour. Follow Danny at Twitter at DannyBurke5. There's a lot of toss-ups, man. A lot of toss-ups uh, in, uh, in that category. And, uh, you know, we'll see where Nebraska's at with their tight ends just from an injury standpoint. Nothing official, nothing from Scott Frost, but... You know how the rumor mill swirls around this time of year with not just one but two of Nebraska's tight ends, one with a mullet, one that can dunk a basketball. Both can dunk a basketball, but you get my point. So that that could be concerning uh, for Nebraska as much as they've at least talked about wanting to use the tight end. Let's go to Michigan and spend a minute on the Wolverines. Is McNamara going to be the guy to get Michigan off of that kind of seven, eight, nine win schneid and have him really competing for the first time in the East since maybe year two or three for Harbaugh. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, Cade McNamara, the likely starter at this point. I know Bowman, you know, he was solid at Texas Tech. We'll see if he can make it competitive for the quarterback race. But I guess my assumption, unless you heard differently, it's probably going to be McNamara. But their win total set at seven and a half, Schmidt, slightly shaded to the under minus 125. Look, this team, I mean, they led the Big Ten with the fewest tackles for loss allowed per game, and the pass protection was really solid. You just need that quarterback there to have some consistency and to be able to swing it. They're getting four starters back on the offensive side of the ball. Hassan Haskins, Blake Corm should be decent in the backfield. And you get about three of the top four wideouts returning. Again, defensively, what you're expecting to be good out of Harbaugh Schmidt last season was bad. I mean, they finished third worst the Big Ten, allowing about 434 yards per game, 35 points per contest. And they only got two interceptions last season. You can't be a successful program and only have that being your staff. But again, what is the quarterback situation going to be, and can you improve defensively for the toss-up games, to me, with Michigan, uh, week two, you get a tough non-con versus Washington. Week six at Nebraska. Week nine at Michigan State, only because that's the in-state type of rivalry matchup on the road. Then week 10 versus Indiana, I have as a toss-up game, too. You get them coming to the big house. But again, if Michael Penix can stay healthy and that defense is top-notch, the Hoosiers are going to be a tough team. But again, you know, the way I separated it, and I'm not going to go over all of it, of course, but I have about five winnable games for them, and I have four toss-up games. If you think they can win all those winnable games being five and it comes down to how many of the toss-up games four, if they can win three out of four of those at least, then I'd say you bet the over. The hook's not ideal, but the fact that the over is even money, Schmitty, I'm willing to take that bet instead of laying the minus 125 for them to stay at seven. They got a lot of turnover. New defensive coordinator coming from the Ravens being Mike McDonald. As much as we want to put down Michigan, I would rather take a little bit of better price and go over seven and a half. All right, Danny, let's uh, wrap up some Big Ten thoughts with Indiana. Much more brutal schedule, tougher road games. They can play D and they can play offense with Penix and those receivers. Again, Schmidt, you're right. I mean, you know, Penix, he's going to be a stud as long as he can stay healthy, but that's the big thing. I mean, what, he's had three season career ending injuries at this point. And, again, the defense was really solid last year, limiting opponents to about 20 points per game in conference play. You need somebody in the backfield to step up, though. Can that run game improve behind this offensive line? But even aside from all of that, you're right, Schmidt. I mean, they have tough games at Iowa, at Penn State, versus Ohio State, and at Michigan. With their win total at 7.5, it is shaded to the under. 
I'm thinking I, I got to go under, if anything, with Indiana. As much fun as they've been, I think you're getting a slowly regressing season, mostly in part because of this tough schedule. I know they're at, they're at Iowa, I think, this year. I think they got to go to Penn State with a little revenge on the Nittany Lions mind. And then you still they get to host Ohio State, but great. So they come to Bloomington. You still, <laughs> you still, got, to, still got to beat them. And uh, that's the one team that put a scare into the Buckeyes last year. So uh, we shall see. Danny, about a minute here. Some thoughts on preseason. Yeah, Schmitty, you know, it, you may think I'm crazy for the amount of plays I have on preseason week one, but a lot of guys make their cake off of NFL preseason. Just rapid fire right here. Uh, Ravens on the money line, Harbaugh, 15-1-1 ATS his last 17 preseason games. He's the king of preseason, played a minus 140 on the money line versus the Saints. Give me the 49ers on the money line, minus 134 versus the Chiefs. Andy Reid in Kansas City doesn't care about preseason. Trey Lance needs to prove something. Shanahan is decent in the preseason. Jags money line minus 125. Baker isn't going to play. Not only do you have Trevor Lawrence, Gardner Minshew allegedly because of Urban Meyer competing for that top spot, and Meyer back in the NFL. He's going to want to make a good impression, so give me the Jags on the money line. Then Chargers on the money line against the Rams. Big line movement in favor of the Chargers. Brand new head coach Staley with a good young squad. Give me the Chargers minus 157 on the money line against Los Angeles Rams. Danny Burke, the hardest working man. He has your preseason trends right there. With Harbaugh, <laughs> my God, that's pretty How good. About it? No, it's money, and I hope it's money for you. Yeah, some 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 uh, Danny's dimes right there. Uh, Danny Burke with his Veasan Sports Network Rush Hour, his show at Danny Burke Five on Twitter, the Pride of Chicago. Danny, be good. Thanks for the time. You bet, Smitty. Thanks as always. Good stuff from the Pride of Chicago. Danny Burke will wind it down, get ready for Field of Dreams Night. Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on a Thursday, it's Hail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. You know who knows how to relax? Deb the Spa Lady, Home Innovation Spas, 20th and Highway 2 in Lincoln, off Industrial Road in Omaha, spasonline.com. And she's always got fair pricing going on, but uh, for real, uh, when it comes to state fair time. Deb, what do you know? Well, I know that in two weeks, two weeks from right now, we will be on State Fair Eve. We will be ready to start the next day on the Nebraska State Fair, and it's crazy because you know we we didn't get to have it last Mm -hmm. year so we're all excited and ready to go for this year and this is a big year for us because last year was supposed to be our 30th year at the fair this year will be our 30th year at the fair so it's a big deal we're really excited deb is that proposition still exists Uh, they bring you a corn dog you show them a hot tub you bet. I give them a better deal if they do that, too. <laughs> you, they've got to physically bring you one. Don't yes. just just don't taunt Deb with the corn dog. You got to no, give her don't one. Say, hey, I'll go get you one later. No, <laughs> you bring it with you. And I would take cheese on a stick. OK. Also. So that so. is a nice audible right there. Deb, the spot. Cheese on a stick or a corn dog. Deb the Spa Lady with us, Hope Innovation Spas, 20th and Highway 2 in Lincoln off Industrial Road in Omaha, spasonline.com. Deb, tell me about this, uh, well, this convoy going with you out to the state fair. That's, oh, that's exactly what it is. We will have truckloads of spas out there. And, you know, I think as far as um, availability, we will actually have spas to sell at the fair. So it's really going to be the old first come, first serve, for sure. But, um, you know, instead of waiting months and months, you're going to be able to pick your spa out and have it delivered immediately. Deb, is the swim spa making the roadie? Oh, you bet. Three of them. A 15-foot, <laughs> oh, another 15, and a 19-foot. Deb, we got to get one of them swim spas in the north end zone. Oh, that'd be, Yeah. I think that'd be a great idea. Just kind of right behind, the, right behind the goalpost. Yeah, and then they can just hop in it as they score the touchdown. I uh-huh. think that'd be great. The Wouldn't sp- that be a hit? The spa lady <laughs> plunge, right? <laughs> That's 
right. I love That's it. for I love sure. It. Well, I know you're gearing up for the fair. Folks can still come see you in Lincoln and in Omaha. Give folks the info on, on when they can see you and uh, also uh, the, the website. Okay, our store hours are Monday through Friday, 10 to 6, and Saturday, 10 to 4. And you can also go to our website. That is spasonline.com. Deb, it's been uh, awesome, and congrats on 30 plus one years of, of State Fair coverage, and congrats on all you guys do. And so excited to talk to you while you're out at the fair as well. Okay, that sounds great. We'll talk next week. All right, Deb, take care. Bye-bye. There she is, Deb, the spa lady, Home Innovation Spas, 20th and Highway 2 in Lincoln off Industrial Road, Omaha, spasonline.com, and she is going to the fair. Corn dog or cheese stick? Corn dog. Amen. Yeah. You're not a ketchup guy, are you? I am. Okay. We got to talk mustard. <laughs> oh, jeez. Mustard. Ketchup's, I mean, ketchup's all right. Yeah. Like on French fries. I like it on hot dogs, too. I... Look at you. My God. Well, it, look, if you dribble, it'll match your, your shirt. Yeah. That's why I like it. Tomorrow, the pride of Fairbury, Bill Dolman, NBC Sports. Black shirt Husker NFLer Jay Moore and the good doctor Derek Peterson. Talk to you on a Friday at four with Hale Varsity. Thanks.